John chapter 20, we will uh, be finishing up the book of John. For next week, be studying the three chapter book of Titus. We're going to go into a study of the book of Titus because there are some things there about the qualification of elders that we need to, we need to look at. I think it's a good book. Of course, all the books are good books. But uh, there are some things there that I think are, are good for us here at Roy City, especially. John chapter 20, it talks about uh, Thomas seeing the risen Lord. Verse 28, Jesus appears. Remember, Tom, Thomas said, I will not believe until I see. Jesus appears and says, in essence, here's the evidence. Here I am. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. I believe this is probably the climax of the book of John. The apex. The central point. Because that is the conclusion you're supposed to draw from all of this information. And Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas, verse 29, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. That's talking about everyone who has not seen the risen Lord, but has faith, believes. And uh, verse 30 and 31, John says this is the reason why this book is written. And truly Jesus did uh, many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have faith in, his, or excuse me, have life in his name. So here you have the reason why John wrote. And he says there are many things, many signs, talking about the miracles that Jesus did that he did not write. He's talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Not only that, Jesus did many other things that were not written down. He's going to say that in the very last verse of the book. We don't have everything Jesus did and said written down for us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have everything we need to know. But we don't have every single thing. The gospel accounts are not strict biography. They're not strict biography. They are written for a purpose to stir up faith. To cause an audience to believe. And you have to take all of them together so that you can get a full picture of what God wants us to know about Jesus Christ. And so these things are written so that we might read it, we might believe it, that Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. It's very interesting. I was watching a program you might have watched it yourself, called Faith Under Fire. It comes on the PAX uh, network, and it's uh, this person who claims to believe in Christ. And he has uh, uh, on his show, it's like a news program, people of opposing views, and they get on the program and they discuss their opposing views. The last night on the program, they had a Muslim scholar and a person claiming to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and uh, being deity. The question was, was Jesus God in the flesh? And, of course, the person claiming to believe in Jesus said, yes, he was God in the flesh. And the Muslim scholar was saying, no, he was not. In fact, the Muslim scholar wrote a book called, Was Jesus God? And in the title of his book, he said, the Bible says no. And I, I'm wondering, have they ever read the book of John? He's claiming that the Bible is saying, no, Jesus is not God in the flesh. But you can't read the book of John and come away with that conclusion. And so they, they got on there and they discussed some things. And the person claiming to believe in Christ brought up maybe just one scripture, but then started quoting scholar so-and-so, and this scholar said this, and this scholar said that. And I was crying out to the television, who cares what scholar so-and-so said? When there were numerous passages from the book of John he could have cited that speaks of the deity of Christ, but he didn't. That's how denominational people think. Scholar so-and-so said this. This is the Judeo-Christian tradition. This is what historic Christianity... Who cares? What does the book say? And so, I think the discussion could have went so much better if he would have decided 
passages from the book of John. John chapter 1. Yes, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus was God. He was not only God, He was human. He was man, just like we are. And it's written for that purpose, that we might believe, and believing you might have life in His name. Believing is not where you stop. Many people want to camp right there and say, that's all you have to do is believe. But you've got to take the whole New Testament, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. This is the same Jesus talking about in verse 15, going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. So believing only is not taught in the Bible. We understand from 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, the same apostle who wrote the gospel according to John wrote 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 3. Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in Him. John, who is described as the apostle of love, was very straightforward. He basically told it like it is. If you say you know Him, I have a relationship with God. I know Him. That's what the word know means. I have a relationship with Him. But you don't keep His commandments. John says you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. Verse 5, But whoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we know Him. So believing that you might have life in His name is a faith that is obedient. You can't just rip this passage, verse 31 of John chapter 20, out of its context and say, this is all you have to do. That's what false teachers do as they twist the Scriptures. They don't want to look at these other passages. They just say, see, that's all there is right there. And that's just false. Even within the book of John itself, we have seen instances where Jesus talks about obediently following Him. Look at uh, chapter 21 and verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed Himself again to His disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, He showed Himself. Here's another account of Jesus appearing after His resurrection. Acts chapter 1 tells us that Jesus appeared over a period of about 40 days. So a little over a month after His resurrection, He appeared to them. Verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Canaan, Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. Verse 3, Simon Peter said to him, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going uh, with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat that, that night, uh, and they caught nothing. Now why would they be going fishing? Didn't they already see the risen Lord? What were they doing? I believe that has something to do with it. Perhaps they still thought the, the mission had failed because they didn't think the, the Messiah was supposed to die. What were they before they would become apostles? Fishermen. They went back to their old occupation. They're not going out there, you know, with a lure and a reel, you know, to uh, you know, do a little angling, uh, catching a bass or anything like that. They're going back to their old occupation. They're going back to their old life. And so it seemed as though that even though they had seen the risen Lord, it didn't impact them to the point of saying, okay, things are better now. Things are going to happen as far as the establishment of the kingdom, which is the church. They didn't understand that. Now we're going to fulfill the mission that Jesus gave us to do to preach the gospel. They didn't understand that. So they went back to their former occupation. And they went and they uh, were fishing all night and they didn't catch anything. Verse 4. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Perhaps because it was uh, morning, the light wasn't clear. Perhaps there was uh, plenty of distance between the shore and where they were. And so they couldn't recognize that it was Jesus. Verse 5, Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you uh, any food? They answered Him, No. They didn't know it was Christ at this time. Verse 6, And He said to them, 
Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw in, draw it in because of the multitude of fish. That's reminiscent of one of the first, some of the first miracles Jesus performed. Remember when Peter was called to be an apostle from his occupation of being a fisherman? You read about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The other uh, gospel accounts. Jesus uh, was, was with them and they cast out the net and they caught a multitude of fish. That was to remind them, I'm Christ. I am the resurrected one. Verse 7, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, who's that? John. That's John's way of describing himself. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. Here we have impulsive Peter. He's not going to wait till the boat gets back to the shore. He's going to put his outer garment back on. Of course, when they were out fishing, fishing with the nets, they were among men, they would strip down to their loincloth to do their work. Well, he said, oh, it's the Lord. Simon Peter jumps in the water. He's going to swim the shore. Verse 8, But the other disciple came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Verse 9, Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and a fish laid on it and bread. So this was a morning meal. Eating fish for a morning meal was strange to us. But in that culture, it was normal. Just as normal as us eating bacon or some other meat. Of course, they wouldn't be eating bacon because they were Jews. But as normal as us eating bacon bacon or, or ham for a morning meal. They would eat fish. That was very common in their culture. Uh, verse 10, Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish uh, which you have just caught. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although uh, there were so many, the net was not broken. 153 fish caught in this net. They had been fishing all night and had not caught one thing. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dare ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Verse 13, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Verse 14, This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So there would be a various appearances. If you turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Jesus presented himself alive, after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of them uh, things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus, during this time, was also teaching them. He was also teaching them during this time. And it's very interesting, we're going to have a conversation here. P, uh, uh, Jesus is going to have a conversation with Peter and, and talk to him about his relationship with Peter and Peter's relationship with him. How many times did Peter deny Christ? Three times. You keep that in mind as we read this. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. So what you have here is you have two different words for love used. The Greeks had more than one word. They had phileo and agape. Agape or agape. Agapeo, some other forms of the same word. Were different words for love. The word that Jesus used here when he says, do you love me, is this word, agape. Do you love me? It's that higher, nobler love that's based on action, not necessarily on feeling and emotion, but it's a higher, obedient, submissive love. 
do you love me? But Peter said to him, You know that I love you. Phileo. He used the word that means to have affection for. Peter didn't use the word agape. He used the word phileo. I love, I have affection for you. And then he says to him to feed my lambs. Later on he's going to talk about feeding the sheep. That word feed means to take care of. It's, it's, a, it's a phrase of, of tending to. You do the work of tending to the sheep. Shepherd language. Verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Agape, me. He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. You know that I phileo you. I have a deep affection for you. He said to him, verse 16, tend my sheep. Again, shepherd language. Verse 17, he said to him a third time. Why would he say this three times? Peter denied him three times. This is why he asked him three times, do you love me? Now, Jesus uses the word that Peter used. Simon, son of Jonah, verse 17, do you love me? He uses this word. Tender, affectionate love. Phileo. Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Have affection for you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Peter was not willing to admit he had this type of love for Jesus, this agape love, probably out of guilt for what he'd done. And so he was not saying, I, I, have the, I don't have this commitment love that I should have. I do have an attachment, a, a, a feeling for you, an affection for you, but I don't have that commitment love as of now. Because he probably was feeling a tremendous amount of guilt. That's why he was grieved there in verse uh, 17. Now, Peter was grieved because he asked him a third time. But in the third question, Jesus used the word that Peter was using, phileo. And Peter says, I love you. You know all things. I love you. And then he says, feed my sheep. He says in verse 15, feed my lambs. Verse 16, tend my sheep. And verse uh, uh, 17, feed my sheep. In other words, I have work for you to do, Peter. I'm accepting you back. Peter evidently had a sense of repentance, willing to turn from what he did, and was accepted back. And Jesus is saying, I have work for you to do. I have work for you to do. Now some, I say some, those in the <coughs> Catholic faith, jump on these passages and say, see, this is Jesus telling Peter that he wants him to be the first pope the first universal bishop over all the church. Because he says to him, I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to tend my sheep. I want you to feed my sheep. And a shepherd does that. And so he is the first pope. Well, that clashes with, with so many things in the New Testament, but especially the writings of the Apostle Peter. Look at First Peter. First Peter. Chapter 2. If anyone starts telling you that Peter was the first pope, just take them to first and second Peter, especially first Peter. He'll deal with it. Peter didn't know he was a pope. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. In context, Peter's talking about the suffering of Christ, how he bore our sins in his own body. By his stripes we are healed, verse 24. For you were like sheep going astray, 
But you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. He's talking about Christ. He's not talking about Himself. Peter was one of the apostles that was going to do the work of the apostles. He wasn't a universal leader of the entire church. That is ridiculous. And also look at uh, chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse 1. The elders, the elders are the shepherds of the church, who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder. That means co-elder. Not the universal bishop of the church, not a pope, but a fellow elder. And a witness of the suffering of Christ, also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God. Be overseers. He says, I'm one of your fellow elders. Then he says in verse uh, 4, When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. The chief shepherd there appearing is talking about Christ. So in no way, shape, form, or fashion by the stretch of anyone's fertile imagination can you get Jesus commissioning Peter to be a pope in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. Now, he would do the work of an apostle like all the rest of the apostles would be doing. And they would be feeding the sheep, the, the Christians, the disciples of Christ, through their writings and through their preaching. They all would be doing that. You know, if I was going to try to come, come up with a pope, I would try to make Paul a pope rather than Peter. I mean, it, it makes more sense if I was going to go that route, but I wouldn't because it's not scriptural. There's only one head of the church, Christ, in heaven and on earth. So to try to, to say that, that, that Peter is, is being commissioned here to be the universal head of the church on earth is, is foolishness at best, and it is false doctrine. The, the Catholic Pope is in ill health, and I hate to be in his shoes on the Day of Judgment. I'd hate to be in his shoes. Verse 18. John chapter 21 and verse 18. Again, Jesus talking to Peter, Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Here's the reason why I said that, verse 19. This he spoke signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So the job of Peter was to follow Jesus Christ and to do his will. And according to New Testament history, of course, Acts chapter 2, you have Peter preaching, but he wasn't the only one preaching. The others were preaching as well. We just have Peter's sermon recorded. And the focus of the latter part of the book of Acts is on Paul, not Peter. Peter was a faithful Christian to the very end. According to a history, uh, Peter died by crucifixion. He was arrested under the Emperor Nero uh, between the years 64 and 68 A.D. because he refused to quit preaching Christ. And he was arrested and was sentenced to be crucified because he was not a Roman citizen. And according to history, Peter requested to be crucified upside down because he was not worthy to die the same way his Lord died. Which shows the tremendous dedication and commitment that man had. The Apostle Paul was beheaded. He was a Roman citizen. He was, he was executed under Nero as well. But because he was a Roman citizen, his execution would have been swift. He was beheaded for the cause of Christ. So, in verse 18 of John chapter 21, Jesus is telling Peter that you're going to be arrested, you're going to be taken where you don't want to go, and that would indicate when he would die. When he would die. And so, according to history, every apostle died a horrible death except John. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Look at verse 20. 
Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, talking about John, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? That's what John asked uh, at the the uh, Passover supper. Verse 21. Peter, seeing him, said to him, But Lord, what about this man? And we're not told why Peter would even ask that. Perhaps because John was a young man. Peter might have been the oldest of the apostles. We don't know for sure. That's speculation. And John might have been the youngest of the apostles. And so Peter might have had an interest in what's going to, what's going to happen to John. What about this man? Verse 22, Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, Peter, you be concerned with yourself. You be concerned with following me. I have a plan for John. And if I will that he should remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. If my will is for John to be alive for hundreds, even thousands of years until I return, why is that any of your concern? You just be concerned about following me. Verse 23, Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple, John, would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? In other words, Jesus was not saying John wouldn't die. It's just saying, if that was my will, why does that concern you? And we have so, some, sometimes we, when we, when we read the Bible or we listen to lessons, we talk about, you know, that, that would have been a good lesson for so-and-so to hear. That would be a good lesson for someone else to hear instead of applying it to us. We're so concerned with everyone else, and we should be concerned in the sense of caring for one another's spiritual well-being, but sometimes we can see the faults in others that quick and not see our own. And so we learn the lesson from this. We need to be concerned about ourselves. What did Jesus say in, in Matthew chapter 7? You remove the plank that is in your own eye. Then you can see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. So Peter needed to learn that lesson. Peter was still pretty much in an immature state at this time. Based on the previous conversation in, in John chapter 21 seems to indicate that. But the, the, the exhortation from, from Jesus to him was, follow me. You follow me. You continue to do my will. Now, were the apostles robots? Did they have to follow Christ? No. They were guided by inspiration as they preached so that every word that came out of their mouth was the words of the Holy Spirit. And as they wrote by inspiration, it was guided by the Holy Spirit so it was perfect. But their lives were not robots in which they were made to do the will of God all the time. In fact, Paul had to rebuke Peter. You read about that in the book of Galatians. Paul had to rebuke Peter for being a hypocrite. And so uh, you have the apostles having free will to follow. So that's why the exhortation is there. Follow me. He wanted him to recognize his own responsibility to him. He said, I want you to follow me. Don't be concerned with other people. Yes, help them. Exhort them. Tend to them. Tend my sheep. Uh, feed my lambs. And help them. But you be concerned with your own spiritual well-being. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2.12 You work that out with fear and trembling. Verse 24. By the way, John, as far as his death, he died, according to history, the only one died of old age. The only apostle to die of old age. Of course, he's, he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. That's why... We read about that in the book of Revelation. But according to history, he was released from that, went back to Ephesus, and stayed there and died in Ephesus, according to history. Verse 24 and 25, we conclude the book of John. This is the disciple who testifies of these things. John is talking here. Who wrote these things 
And we know that his testimony is true. A testimony is something that is seen and heard. He is bearing witness. No one today can give a testimony. No one today can bear witness. This is something John saw. He witnessed with his own eyes. And he heard. In fact, turn to John, 1 John chapter 1. He speaks of that. 1 John chapter 1. Verse 1, that which we, excuse me, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. It's talking about Christ. The life was manifest, and we have seen and bear witness. That's why they're witnesses. They saw him, they heard him, they handled him, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifest to us. So today, there's no witnesses. No one is witnessing for Christ scripturally. And no one is giving a testimony scripturally. This is true testimony. The disciple John was there. He saw it. He heard it. He handled him concerning the word of life. Back to chapter 21 and verse 24. He says, I wrote this down. Of course, he would have been guided by the Holy Spirit. Remember the passages we looked at earlier in the book of John? The Holy Spirit will be with your memory. This book was probably written towards the end of the first century. Probably as much as 60 years after the events took place. Verse 25. There are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written down one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books which would be written. Amen. So John is saying not everything about the life of Christ is written down. He says if it were, the world itself couldn't contain the books. But we are told exactly why these things were written. Verse 30 and 31 of chapter 20. Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. So the book of John teaches us and tells us basically the life of Christ looking at His deity. Like I said at the beginning of the lesson, how can someone say the Bible does not say Jesus was God in the flesh if they read the book of John? John 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, And the Word was God, John 1 and verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld, that's John and the apostles, we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Gospel according to John was written to to verify that God became flesh, dwelt among us, suffered and died and was resurrected. And John says, when you believe this, you truly believe, you will follow, and you will have eternal life. Much, much more can be said about the the Gospel according to John, but we will leave it there. As I said, next week, Lord willing, we will start in the book of Titus.